ask for us. I'll take up offering afterwards. But I just want us to look at the Word of God for a few moments this morning. And I want us to be challenged by the Word of God. And however, I want us to be inspired by the Word of God. Listen, if all we had in our life were inspirations alone, uh, it would leave us not with a sense of urgency to overcome and not with a sense of victory in the middle of the challenge. But when the Word of God challenges us, it helps us to overcome. How many of you ever looked down the road before and you saw trouble? You ever looked down the road before and you saw trouble? I mean, if we look at it in a tangible way, if you look down the road, you see that this is down the road, maybe the police officers are doing a random check and you think, great, and this is the day that I don't have my driver's license with me. Or this is the day that I forgot to put the new insurance card in the, the, the vehicle. So you look and you see that there's a challenge down the road or maybe that exam that you had forgot about you've not studied for, but you know it's here, so now you have it. Or you maybe are the one that you know you have to get up and give a speech. And you, and you think, man, I'm not even going to know my name when I get up there because that's how nervous and anxious I am at, at, at delivering this. You know, all kinds of things. Or how many has ever gone to the dentist's office and you know that you need to have something done and you think about having to get that drill done and you know that it's not going to be a pleasant thing, but you know the end result is good. And maybe you take it back to the room and the next thing you know you heal the drill in the room before and it sounds like someone hanging drywall or putting your screws in the wall to hang a picture, you know. And so, uh, you know, uh, sometimes our fantasies can turn into just uh, full-fledged Frankensteins, if you would. You know, our fantasy imagination, uh, 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 you know, they can just run wild. Uh, but, but, but on the other hand, we, we know that there are times where we just have to grit our teeth and say, I'm going to get through this. Now, I'll get to the spiritual aspect in a moment, but we've all been there where we grit our teeth and we say, I'm just going to have to get through this. Maybe you remember a man by the name of Sean uh, Fujimoto. And uh, Sean was one of the greatest uh, gymnasts in the world, and he was in the Olympics. And Sean uh, has spent the majority of his life uh, as a Japanese man preparing for uh, the gold medal. He had trained for many, many years. And uh, as he mounts on the ring and he performs his breathtaking routine, he landed, and when he landed, he broke his leg. <laughs> However, the Olympics was going on, Brother David, what's he going to do? His friends come and find him and carry him, Brother Josh, uh, to where he's taken to the doctor, and he goes to the doctor, and uh, as he goes to the doctor, it's determined that his leg is broken, Sister Susan, and they put a cast on there. Uh, he's just in excruciating pain. Uh, and he, he's disappointed that during the Olympics, he breaks his legs. Uh, and he, br he broke his leg. And so there it is. Uh, he's laying in his bed. Sister Dowd, he's thinking about how that, that this has been what the majority of his life he has prepared for. He's wanted Sister Tina. And so the Olympics begins the next day, and there they are at the gymnastic events. And lo and behold, would you believe who shows up to the rings to put his hand on them? But Sean uh, Fujimoto shows up and he has a cast on his leg. And so here it is. And he in his mind is thinking, what I need for the gold medal is this. I need to get at least a 9.0, hopefully a 9.5 that we can win the gold medal in the Olympics. There he is, he had figured everything out. There he is flipping his legs as he's holding on to the rings, not only with one good leg, but one leg in a cast. And uh, as, as he's there, uh, he realizes that uh, he's having to balance the extra weight of, uh, 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 of that cast being there. And so uh, he comes to the end of his routine and he flies through the air and he flips and he twirls and he lands on his feet and his cast it shatters. 
as his teammates watch him standing there, there are tears running down his face, and the judges begin to give their numbers, and he finds out that he made it where he wants to be. It is well over a nine. He falls in agony and disbelief, amen, that he's able to get the gold medal. But when he's asked, how did you do it, Sean? He said, it was like a knife stabbing through me. He said, but I grit my teeth and I realized that at the end of the pain, there was going to be a great reward for me if I would endure. Saying of God, I want to tell you, it may feel like pain, and you may feel like you've got to grip your teeth, grip your teeth. But at the end, there is a great reward for you. Amen. Tears streaming down his cheek. He stood a ramrod straight. He finished the routine. He collapsed. His teammates carried him off. The score flashed 9.5. And his team won the gold medal. Amen. It's going to hurt you. you got to grit your teeth and get through it, knowing that there's something good at the end. Praise God. Amen. It's important to remember that Christ gives us the resources for everything that we need to get through life. Will I smile again? Will I be the same again? Will I make it? Will my mind endure all of this? You can do it because Christ has equipped you to be able to make it. Child of God, and at the end, the reward is greater than any of the pain we may endure to get there. Ursula Haley Good is a, a, science, a science fiction writer, and she talks about a new world. And much of the new world that she talks about is a wonderful world. And so that's what she makes her living by, is painting a beautiful new world. I want to tell you, saint of God, more than a cross on top of our steeple, more than beautiful altars and crosses that, that, that hang that are sacred, amen, it's time that we begin to show the world Amen, that it can be a beautiful new world if you'll let Jesus Christ in. All things are passed away and before all things have become new. But the saints of God moan and groan and act no differently oft times than what the world responds to their troubles. So it's not a new world. I'm telling you, it's time that we stop building walls up and barriers and let down minor differences and begin to show the world that it's a whole new world in Jesus Christ and that we can make it and at the end God has something very good for us. Amen. Uh, we, we've not been called to, 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 to uh, this morning, uh, we've not been called to, 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 to uh, ourselves try to change things, but when we allow the power of Christ to be changed in us, we show this world a whole new world. John Mack was a prize-winning psychiatrist from Harvard, and uh, some of his writings showed that it was those who went through difficult things and those who were in prison that showed the greatest leadership skills. Wow, John Mack, that's amazing. But I think the Word of God showed us that long before you ever come along. I want to look at four positions of faith very quickly this morning. I want to look at some individuals that showed us what it was like to have faith in the middle of adversity and see God work and move. Some you'll be familiar with, others you may not be as familiar with. But this morning the very first I want to look at is that of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, in the book of Jeremiah 37 and 38, I won't turn there, but you can reference it later. If you look at the history of Jeremiah, you'll find that the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, he had made Zedekiah, who was a, 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 a Josiah's son, he made him king of Judah. And uh, Zedekiah, uh, he refused to follow the word of God and the rest of the officials who were leaders with Zedekiah. 
However, they called for Jeremiah to come and give them a word from the Lord. And Jeremiah came and he gave them a word from the Lord. He said, I want you to know that the Babylonians are going to come against you, but the Egyptians are going to come in and help you. There will be many that will be wounded. But Brother David, he said, I need to tell you that there's some bad news. That once the Egyptians leave, the Babylonians are going to come in full force and they're going to overtake you. They didn't like the word that Jeremiah had given, uh, but they listened. And so Jeremiah, when the Babylonians began to come in, he began to make his way back uh, 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 to uh, 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 his homeland uh, there in Jerusalem because he wanted to get his property and things that were his. When he was at Jerusalem, he was met at the gate by what we would know today as police officers. He tried to explain himself and claiming his family's property. However, the police officers felt that he was making an alliance with the Babylonians. And so they took him and they put him in captivity. There was the man of God. He's doing right. He's doing what God had called him to do. But now he's misread. He's misinterpreted. And he's put, being put into captivity. Yes, child of God. You're going to go through hard times. And as much as you do what's right, there are going to be moments where you're going to find yourself in positions that you prefer not to be in. But God's promised to be there. We find that uh, 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 Jeremiah... He was kept in Jeremiah 37, 16 in an underground cell for a very long time. Eventually, King Jedekiah, he asked uh, 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 for him privately, and he said, is there any message from the Lord? And Jeremiah said, there is. You're going to be handed over to the king of Babylon. And so he begged them not to be sent back to this, this horrible place. And so he sent him uh, to, to the king's uh, 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 courtyard, the palace place. But when bread ran out, he was now sent to a very miry place. In fact, the Word of God says that it was a place that it was a cistern. It was a place where there was water. You ever been where water's been dried up before for a little bit? And you step in there and it's like... Shoo, your foot slips, Brother David. You sink down in the miry clay. Can you imagine? It's limestone. All the water's been emptied out. There's nothing but that residue of limestone that left with a little bit of water, and it's mucky and it's miry. Uh, the, 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 the width of it about four feet, three feet in height, and he's kept there in prison. Brother, Brother Wally, there's not enough room for him to stand. It's not really comfortable to lay. Uh, he can't sit. The only place he really has to be in position is kneeling in the miry clay. Whoa! Whoa! That sounds like positions you and I are at times. The only place that we're really left in is kneeling in the miry clay. You ever felt like you've been there before, God? Here I am. Amen. I feel like I'm slipping. I feel like I'm sliding. I feel like I'm sinking. There's no comfortable position in life. So here I am, and I am kneeling in the mire. I'm kneeling in the mud. I'm kneeling in the mud. I, 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 I'm doing whatever I can do to survive. However, there was an Ethiopian servant in the king's palace, Ebed Melech, who remembered Jeremiah and began to work on his behalf. And so we find that this Ethiopian's kindness was uh, to uh, repay back to him and his life was spared, spared later. But I need to tell you something. Saint of God, listen to me right here. When you find yourself in the mire, slipping and sliding and in the muck and in the mud, I want you to know that you have a friend in the king's palace who's praying. You're not alone. You're not alone. There are saints, amen, who are lifting you up before the throne. You have a church family that you support. In every church, there is an Ebed Melech, amen, that, that is keeping you and praying for you. And I want you to know that you may be the Ebed Melech right now, but there may be a time where you're the Jeremiah, but God's going to have someone praying for you. And I ultimately want you to know this this morning. 
Amen. That we have a Savior who sits on the right hand of God, who's ever praying and interceding for us. You may say, I feel like I'm slipping. I feel like I'm sliding. I don't want to be here to muck. I don't want to be here to mire. I don't want to be here to mud. Amen. But someone is praying for you. And this won't last always. You may feel like you're trying to survive. You may feel like there's no other comfortable position. You may feel like you've tried to do right and you don't deserve it here. And you are right, but God's allowed you here. But God is going to deliver you from the muck and from the mire and from the mud. Keep your head up because there are others who are praying for you and have your best interest in mind. Hallelujah. That is the position of faith you've got to take this morning. Jeremiah's position of faith, amen, it was not a prayer. He was kneeling in the mire until he was released to the miracle. Hallelujah. Do you hear me this morning? Kneeling in the mire until you're released to the miracle. I believe that God is still in the miracle working business. I believe that God wants to deliver from the mire. Amen. If we will trust Him. Amen. Jeremiah, God will show you the miracle. Amen. Hallelujah. It's the position of faith. Amen. Kneel in the mire. Amen. Until you're released to the realm of the miraculous. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Be faithful. So kneeling in the mire. How about walking in fire? We're familiar with this, aren't we? If I ask you walking in the fire, what are you going to say? There's going to be three boys who come in the eye. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We don't like the mire, but we don't like the fire either. But I want to tell you that the mire was a position of faith. And so is the fire, a position of faith. There it was, everything they had done right. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel chapter number 3. Amen. One of the most dramatic stories in the Old Testament. Amen. These three uh, bu bu bureaucrats, uh, they stood up to the king. And, and so uh, he said, listen, he said, I want you to heat the fire seven times hotter than it's normally heated. Even those working around the fire, they succumb to the heat, to the flame. And so it's important to understand that, uh, that the challenging message here this morning, uh, our God who we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. He is able, no definition of with, if you will, but He is able. Listen, wherever you are, you got to know that God is able. I'm letting the outcome up to God. You see, you know the road, you see the struggle, we don't know the outcome. Listen, we don't live in Walt Disney World where we rub a little ball and we look in there and we see all the mystical things about the future. God doesn't work that way because it would never help our faith. And so He says, whether in the mire or in the fire, I want you to trust Me with the outcomes. And I want you to be positioned in such a way that you know that I will work and I will move for you. But one thing that is for sure, that in the middle of the furnace, that God will be with us. We don't see them delivered from the furnace, but David, they're thrown into the furnace. But we see that in the middle of the fire, that God is working, walking with them. What is your fire this morning? Maybe it's hot for you. Maybe other people look and don't think that that's such a hot flame. Amen. But for you, you know it's hot. And you don't want to be here. And it's difficulty. And it seems life staking And you're concerned about it. I want you to know this morning that if God doesn't deliver you immediately from the fire, or if God doesn't deliver you at all from the fire, the necessary thing for you to know is that have faith in the middle of the fire that God is walking with you and He is there for you. Amen. Just to know that God is with me. That's all I need to know. Whether it's through difficulty or whether it's through good, God don't let me go alone because I need you. Faith says that He walks with us through the fire. Aren't you glad God sends heavenly messengers? Amen. When the heat is on, amen. He sends angels to encamp around about us. Amen. God comforts us when we're in a challenging position that challenges our faith with a fiery furnace. God is there. 
Let me tell you, never complain about the position of the firmness. Because God may have you there for a minute, so. God, why am I here? I don't like it. Let me tell you that on the outside, looking at, wait a second, how many do we grow and fight? How many were bound? But I'm looking in and I see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and it almost looks like the form of God in there walking around with them. Do you know what God is doing in your life? Amen. You've cried out to be used of God. You've cried out for God to work and move through you. Amen. Don't think the fire that you're going through, amen, is a test that's going to to get you and to knock you out. But God has you here for a reason. Amen. He is demonstrating to a world that He's working and moving in your life and that He delivers from the most fiery circumstances when we put our faith and our trust and our confidence in Him. He will work and move for His glory. Amen. We find that they come out of the fire. Amen. And we find that the King of Nebuchadnezzar, He said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent His angel and delivered them uh, from the fiery furnace. He said, I don't want any other God worship except for their God. Some place, sometimes the best place that we can be is in the middle of the fire. God's working, brother. God's working, sister. Amen. Oh, have faith. Amen. Do you see that other people are viewing a different light? Amen. They see you, but they see your God. So in the middle of the fire, in the middle of the night, but the position of faith is also found in singing in the stocks. Stuck in stocks. Inevitable. Acts 16, 16 through 40, we find that Paul and Silas they encounter some trouble at uh, uh, Philippi. And so it leads to them being bound in stocks and in chains. And so, because they stand on the authority of God's work, and they trust God, here they are with guards changing every so many hours so that they don't become weary of watching Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas bound up, and so faith begins to rise up in them. Faith but alive begins to rise up. Sister Tina, their faith is different. Different than kneeling in the mire and prayer. And different than trusting God with confidence in the fire. But their faith rises up as a spiritual to song. And they begin to sing, Brother David. Oh, victory is mine. Victory is mine. Maybe they were singing, What a day that will be. Maybe they were singing Amazing Grace. Maybe they were singing He Set Me Free. Maybe they were singing There's Still Power in the Blood. I don't know what their songs were. I, I, I know these songs weren't right. But one thing I know about Bobby, they were singing in the middle of their situation. They allowed faith to rise up. Did you ever just begin to sing when your faith is tested? Amen. When you're in stocks and you're in bonds and, and you're wondering this is an injustice. God, I shouldn't be here. I don't deserve this. Amen. But all of a sudden, uh, their faith rises up. It isn't misery. It isn't despair. Amen. But it's pure confidence in God. So they begin to sing and they begin to celebrate the greatness of God. Amen. God is great whether I'm bound or whether I'm free. Amen. Whether I'm healthy, whether I'm sick. God is great whether in life, whether in death. God is sick. Whether I'm rich, whether I'm poor, whether everything is going good, whether I have security or whether I'm insecure. God is still great and I'll praise Him. That is what faith says. They didn't moan groan about the miserable plight or their current condition. Listen, praise will accomplish a lot more. Praise will accomplish a lot more. 
I'm not complaining. I believe this. You can take it for what it's worth. But I believe praise will help us a lot more sometimes than even our petition. We begin to praise. And praise precedes faith. It will begin to build your faith up. First we sing, and then we believe. So in the mire, in the fire, in the stocks, the fourth is when we're handcuffed to the enemy soldiers. Ask Peter about it in Acts chapter number 12. Peter had been jailed by Herod and already killed James, the brother of John, who was Peter's fellow laborer. And so now he was waiting until the festival period of seven days of unleavened bread before he killed Peter. I'd like to think about that speech. You have a chicken to a soldier. And after the festival is over, I'm going to die. Listen, I know we think about our mortality at times in our life, particularly when we're diagnosed with something we're thinking about. There are different times where we visit our mortality. I believe the older we get, we visit our mortality. But how would you like to think about your mortality in terms of days? You know, you can pinpoint it. So there it was, Peter. What would you have been like if you were counting down your mortality and when you were going to die? You shackled and handcuffed the two guards, one on one side, one on the other. And there was guards who stand watching the gate. And Mary wasn't taking any chances. And so here it was that in, in this situation, he was bound. But he also knew that God had a plan. Maybe in his mind he was thinking about what Job says, but he knew the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as pure gold. There shall come forth a vessel for the fire. I believe that Peter was making a choice for the better there. I don't know all the inside of Peter. I know there was a church that was praying. And I know he was about to knock on the door and surprise some people. But he was making a better choice. Listen, I don't know what you're facing. I know what God's laid on my heart for this message. I know what Brother Dennis in the song service was leading us. I know what the Spirit of God spoke and ministered to us. I know what God's doing around the altar. So God's saying this, that your position of faith is your choice. How will you choose? Whether in the mire, whether in the fire, whether in the prison, or whether handcuffed to the end. What will be your choice? Maybe you just need to kneel in the mire and pray. Maybe in the fire you need to trust God whatever the outcome that God is in. Let the outcome up to Him. It's His anyway, not yours. Maybe you didn't know even when you feel like you're handcuffed to the enemy that all oh, when He had tried me I shall come out to His pure call. That this vessel is going to be even fire because of what God's working in God's time. The choice is yours. See, God can be still delivered from the mire to the miraculous. But until He doesn't, what will you choose? Sometimes I choose petition, petitions. But sometimes I just need to sing to Jesus' song that will help my faith that I can trust God. Whether you need to grab on to a petition or whether you need to grab on to a song this morning, the choice is yours. But ultimately, whatever brings you to faith, you got to grab on to it. And God will see you Would you stand all around the sanctuary this morning? Would you stand? I've had us frozen. I've had us freezing this morning. Sorry for the cold air. I'm trying to make you comfortable. I can't do it. You can't do it. But when you grab on to God, God can do it. Would you bow your head right where you are right now? And would you say,